Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you don't have a seat and want a seat, there are some bleachers open. <laughs> okay, so good afternoon, good evening. My name is Jenny Castle, and I am a Windsor resident, and I am the moderator for the, the forums this week. Just to make sure everyone is aware, these are forums are put on by nonpartisan groups, not necessarily the town, but these nonpartisan groups are actually have created these forums. So just a few clarifications I wanted to make for everyone who's watching this or who's with us tonight. So um, we're going to go over the ground rules very quickly. Questions can be submitted in writing or answered personally. And in order to ask a question, we do need you to come over to this area where the microphone is. And we'll help you when you get over there if you need help with the mic. But this is being recorded for Win TV, So we do need you to actually stand at the podium where the mic is so we can capture your, your questions. And the other mic is so everyone can hear what everyone's saying, OK? I will acknowledge the person that's ready to ask a question before they ask their question. Each person can ask one question at a time. If you have a second question, we ask that you hold that until everyone has been able to ask one question. You have a maximum of one minute to ask your question. That's important because we are timing this. We want to make sure everyone has a chance to ask their questions and receive an answer. So you will be held to that one minute time limit and we'll give you a signal when 30 seconds has elapsed and then when one minute is over. Um, we do ask that we all act in a respectful and professional manner. I don't think that's going to be a problem, but just, you know, it seems like it's good to say it out loud. And um, I may have to restate the question or I might be asked to clarify something um, that somebody's asking, so I, I will do that. And just to make very clear, we are not entertaining statements or opinions tonight. We are asking that you do bring a question simply stated to the podium so our um, speakers can answer that for you. And if there, for any reason you have to have a conversation out in the audience, we ask that you just step outside to make sure that everyone in here can still hear the questions and answers. So, um, or if your phones are going off, maybe quiet your phone, put it on vibrate. So without any further ado, I'd like to thank Town Manager, Mr. Souza, and Superintendent, Dr. Craig Cook, for being here tonight. And we're going to get this started with a little bit of introduction from each of them. Good evening, folks. How are you? Good. We've got two mics here, so we'll see how well I do. I tend to speak with my hands, so apologize if uh, this mic is not projecting enough. So um, thanks for coming out on this rather warm summer evening. Um, I was joking with someone today that I really need to change the work uniform at Town Hall in the summer because wearing ties in the middle of, middle of the summer is not uh, conducive to my laundry bill. But um, so I wanted to touch on a few items this evening just by way of introduction. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall revenues for the town for the fiscal year 2016 budget year and then talk a little bit about the expen expenditure side just to give you a little bit of background and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Cook um, for him to provide some introductory remarks as well before we get into what most importantly is um, to listen to your questions and try to provide um, information for you. So starting off, overall the town council provided a couple objectives for me and staff to prepare the town um, side of the budget this year. And they really boiled down to two items. One was to preserve and in some cases, if possible, enhance the current service levels. So preserve and then in a few cases, if possible, if resources allowed, was to enhance our current levels of service. And the second primary objective was to be able to make sure that we're reinvesting in our various assets in infrastructure. So reinvesting in our school buildings, our roads, our parking lots, and our parks, for example. We have over $103 million of 
assets that the town owns. That's everything from, again, our buildings, our streets, our storm drainage collection systems, our vehicles, police vehicles, public works equipment, all values at $103 million. So we need to continue to reinvest in an appropriate way so that we are not falling behind, dramatically behind in those deferred maintenance, areas of deferred maintenance. So in terms of revenue, the state aid, which makes up of just under 15% of the overall budget in terms of revenue, the state aid we receive from the state of Connecticut is essentially flat from fiscal year 15 into fiscal year 16, which starts July 1st. We also have a category that is referred to as non-property tax revenue, and that's revenue that we receive from building permits, from other small grants or fees that folks will pay. For example, when you sell a piece of property, there's a small um, amount of, of um, excise tax that the town receives, and then there's a portion that goes to the state. And so those are non-local tax revenues. That equates to, excuse me, those revenues were going up about 1% just under 1%, which from a dollar perspective is about $110,000 increase from the previous fiscal year going into FY16. So 1% of our overall revenues is about $110,000. The next major category, obviously, for revenues is what we receive from property tax, be it your motor vehicle, be it personal property that businesses pay, and our real estate, be it uh, your home, be it a commercial property, or vacant land in town. That's what we refer to as the, we refer to as to the grand list. And the grand list increased a net of $13 million. Our overall, our grand list on a town-wide basis is approximately $2.8 billion. And so we, our, total assessed value increased by $13 million. At a mill rate of approximately 31 mills, that generates an additional $412,000 in revenue. So you increase $110,000 for the non-tax revenue, and then the $412,000 or so in taxes from the grand list from new growth. That's basically the amount of new revenue that was coming in to the town without changing the mill rate, tax rate at all. I want to talk a little bit more, without getting too detailed about our grand list, there's been some commentary um, over the course of the last few years regarding um, why are our taxes continuing to go up with all the economic development that the community has seen. And we certainly have um, been fortunate to have economic development in town. Um, but the grand list does change each year. And I'm going to use this past year as an example. About 15% of our grand list, our taxable value, is related to personal property that businesses, both large and small, um, have. And that property, by state law, by the tax code, depreciates each year. And we normally see approximately an eight to $10 million in depreciation in value each year. And so we need to have a minimum of eight to $10 million reinvestment by our business community in personal property. We've been fortunate over the last five or six years to, to see that reinvestment level plus a little bit more. Unfortunately, this past October, when we do set the grand list, we had one fairly large personal property account. Um, they reduced their amount of equipment. It was a data center in town. And so that was about a 16 or $17 million in lost prop assessed value. So you take our normal 8% depreciation plus that one particular company that, that um, moved equipment out of town, we're in, a, we're in a hole. And so any new growth from 
pardon me, I'm sorry, my back, is any new growth, for example, from Amazon or the additional um, monies that we received from Dollar Tree basically had to first go to offset that depreciation in personal property. And so our net gain, that's where we resulted in a net gain of about $13 million. I just wanted to make sure that folks had a little bit of understanding, because um, if we hadn't had that large drop in personal property value, then the tax rate would not have had to go up the degree that it did in order to meet the proposed expenditure levels. The, so, in, Right now, as the budget stands, as amended by the town council a few weeks ago, 83% of the revenue would come from property taxes, both commercial, motor vehicle, and all of our residential properties, about 83%. And that's pretty much in line with across, when you look at communities across the state, that's pretty much the, the ratio or proportion um, in taxes, from, excuse me, from, in property tax. We get about 12.5% of our revenue from state aid related to schools. And then the remaining 5% um, or so is related to, as I said, from building permit fees, small grants, and then other, other fees that you may pay um, during the, that we may collect during the course of the year. So that gives a little bit of picture on the revenue side. And then looking at expenditures. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about ways in which we've attempted to mitigate, both on the school side and the town side, we've tried to mitigate expenditures over the last five to seven years. And I believe some of you may have gotten a, um, a, a handout that lists some of those um, efforts to reduce or mitigate cost, um, costs. And I'm going to touch on a few of those just now. Um, we do cooperative in bulk purchasing through the Capital Region Council of Governments, and so we gain some savings in that area. For example, we buy our diesel fuel and our gasoline through those cooperative purchasing arrangements. We also have leased out, if you will, in effect, a variety of our buildings, roofs on our buildings for solar, uh, for solar panels. We've contracted with a uh, company that you may have all heard of, Solar City, and they have basically put, at no cost to the town, solar panels um, on a variety of our schools, as well as one of our community centers, two, both community centers, LP Wilson, as well as the 330 Windsor Avenue Community Center, and then the Windsor Volunteer Ambulance Building on Bloomfield Avenue. And we are able to, A, get a benefit of generating, of not having to buy that electricity on a day like today, and then we also are able to purchase electricity at a significantly less rate than if we were to purchase it through CLMP. In the last five years, electricity use townwide has decreased by 33%. So our kilowatt hours are 33% lower. And that's from a couple different things. One is that installation of solar, but also what the Public Building Commission has done and town council has done through reinvesting in more energy efficient um, equipment. For example, the boiler in this building was replaced approximately six years ago, and so the heating system is much more efficient than it had been the original boiler um, and heating plant here. Um, this 33% decrease has translated into a $490,000 savings over the course of the last five years. We've also converted a number of our school buildings to natural gas from oil um, heating source, and that also has saved $400,000 since 2010. On the general government side, we have also reduced our full-time headcount, if you will. And if you go back to the budget 10 years ago, there was six full-time positions more, there are six full-time positions more than than they are today on the general government side. And that's about a three and a half percent reduction in force. We've done that through a couple different ways. Um, we have reduced um, a couple department director positions. We've uh, made a f uh, one position into a part-time position. 
And so um, we've tried to do that without mitigating the impact on terms of services um, to, the, to the community. A few other things, and I know, Jenny, I'm running a little bit long, um, but we do have the other costs that continue to increase. Um, maintenance and repairs to our fleet, um, our buildings have continued to grow. We've had to continue to reinvest in our infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier, which has increased our debt service um, in the last four or five years. Uh, we have taken advantage of the rather low interest rate um, environment. Um, but we have over two, combining the schools and the town, we have over 2.7 million square feet of facilities to maintain. So if you picture an ING or Hartford Life building, those are about 500 and 550,000 square feet. So we have 2.7 million square feet to maintain over the, over the entire town. So it does take money, unfortunately, to maintain that. Um, We've also had increases in our workman's, unfortunately, in our workman's compensation and our insurance liability. Um, and so we've, some of those cost savings that I, admit, that I mentioned earlier are being offset by increases in cost on other sides of, um, of the expenditure um, ledger. So what I'll wrap up at this point and say that over the last five years, the overall budget combined school and town on average has gone up 2.4% on an expenditure basis. 2.4% each year on average in the last five years. The FY16 budget as amended by the town council most recently, the expenditure increase is 1.8%. The tax rate would go up 1.5%. Percent. Did I say that? Percent, percent? All right. Um, residential properties, the average residential property would see a tax increase of $71. That's across town. The average residential property would see a $71 increase. 93% of all residential properties will see less than a $100 increase compared to your tax bills last July. So with that, that provides you a little bit of how we got here in the bigger picture in terms of revenue and expenditures. And look forward to answering questions that you have after Craig provides an overview. Thank you, Peter. So as, as Peter said, my name is Craig Cook. I'm the school superintendent. And I'll just go through um, briefly our, our budget and some highlights and really try and address some of the information that's been out there and, and uh, share some of the, the major uh, points we want to um, share and, and as well be able to answer any questions after. So our current school budget is an increase of 1.2% over last year. That does not include, just to be clear, any preschool costs related to that. So we are not opening an additional building. There's no additional preschool costs in our, in our budget um, for next year. Over the past, or for this current year, for over the past six years, the school budget has increased an average of 1.4%. During that time, the Connecticut average for school districts was 2%. The Connecticut average for school districts for this current year was 2.1%. So Windsor has been consistently below the state average in terms of school um, budget increases. During that time, fixed costs have risen substantially. So our transportation costs, our bus costs, have gone up two to 3% each year. Our magnet school tuition costs and um, special ed costs related to magnet school tuitions have gone up 10% each year. Our employee costs have been pretty steady at 2% of each of those years. And special education tuition, that is um, special education students that are tuitioned outside of Windsor and attend schooling outside of Windsor, is in the 8 to 10 percent range. So those are some of the major cost drivers. And they all are, as, as we're showing, are beyond what um, our budget increases have been. So what, is that, what does that mean? Typically what that has meant is, is that students that are attending Windsor public schools are, are seeing some type of reduction, so we were able to meet those outside costs. Our cost per student, um, there's been a, a lot made out of this. What has been difficult for us with this issue is the state of Connecticut is several years behind in terms of their calculation. And the reason we've always relied on the state of Connecticut um, calculation is that school districts and towns work together in varying different ways across uh, Connecticut. And so for instance, in, at our schools, outside of our schools, the town of Windsor plows our, our parking lots in the, in the winter. They um, mow our, our major grass areas. They take care of our athletic fields. 
And so that's a cost that's not in our budget, but that's in the town's budget. There are some districts where all the um, custodians are part of the town, and so those costs are, are part of the town budget. And so the state goes through a complicated process to really calculate that uh, per pupil cost. The last number that I have from the state is from the 2011-2012 year, and that number was $16,456. We have, to provide the public more information, done our own calculation. We will await the state's official calculation, but our own calculation for this past school year that we just finished on June 30th was $18,200. So it has risen over those, over those years, and that's, as I said, our, our, our calculation. We are responsible for every single student from Windsor. So if a student attends a magnet school, if a student goes to um, a private school, there's most often costs that are associated that we pay for, for that. And I'll, I'll address the magnet schools a little bit because that was a pretty common question that we received last night. Um, so um, there are, there are 3,800 students that are estimated for, um, for Windsor for this current school year. We have a professional firm do a projection for us. We have, over the last three years, always outpaced that projection um, because we have more students coming back to Windsor from magnet schools, from private schools that we've seen in, in, in recent times. So that's a, that's a positive news. Do more students are, are selecting Windsor to public schools to attend um, school than, than outside um, sources than in, in previous years. Um, in terms of magnet schools, so our cost, we have a tuition bill that goes with, along with magnet school tuitions. The state pays about $10,000 to each of those schools directly, and then the town that sends a student to those schools pays typically on average um, between six and 8,000. Some are as low as 4,000, but the majority of them are between six and $8,000 set by um, the magnet school, which we are required to pay. Now, um, I've had people say to me, well, that's a savings for you, right? Because you are paying $18,200 for every student that attends a Windsor school, and then a uh, magnet school is less. And I, the, the answer to that is a little complicated. It takes a little time, but it's very important, I think, to share in that that student leaving Windsor, so that, that eighth grader that leaves a class of 20, they'll leave us with 19, that typical cost is around $500. That's consumable books, that's maybe fees, that's um, materials that we provide our students throughout that school year. That's about $500. And I'm set, we're sending out six to $8,000 to that magnet school. Um, we continue to receive some, from the state grant funding for that student because they are a Windsor student and they can come back at any point. But there's also additional costs too. So if that student leaving us has to receive, is required to receive any special education services, we get a bill for those services. And so for instance, it is typically cheaper, less expensive for me to provide speech services to a student that attends a Windsor school than for us to provide speech services to a student that attends a magnet school. We receive a straight $80 per hour when it goes to a magnet schools. If I have that 20th student at Sage Park School, I have a, we have a speech pathologist on staff that provides those services. So typically, there's not a, an additional cost to that. We already have the principal, we already have the nurse, we already have the building on, and so that's the reason why that cost, um, you know, for that student staying in Windsor is less expensive than, than, than going out. Um, there was lots of discussion and, and questions about the um, number of positions of um, school employees. I have 20 copies of our employee count. I didn't know how many people were here. We were trying to stay green as possible. Um, and that, that, it's on our website. So if you go to the Windsor Public Schools website, the first thing you'll see is budget information. And there's our employee count um, right out there. One of the confusions that was caused was at the end of last budget. So when we were building the budget for last fiscal year, the board and the finance committee asked us to include grant positions for this coming year. So when we built the budget, we built it with grant positions in there. And that was a direction of the board to provide more information. So as you, per, as you can imagine, as we provide pos, position counts that of employees that are paid out of a grant, that's going to raise those counts. It's not going to necessarily match up. We took a lot, we took a lot of time and explained that, but I think that there was some, a lot of confusion on that. So um, that is a um, position, but as you see, that, that employee count includes every employee as of today. Now things will change. We still have a reduction to make in our um, budget. Another question that came out was what percentage is the board of the entire town budget? We are 62%. I will tell you that is right around average in all the towns in Connecticut, 
of um, in in just about every town, the majority of the town budget relates to schools um, directly. Um, another question that was raised was our year-end balance, and so we are still finalizing that. We're very close to finishing that, and um, the reason why we are still getting June bills in. So, as you think of, you know, budgeting, you're you're still in July and even into August. Sometimes getting those June bills in, you know, funds that we spent. Um, and so we are still in that, that we are ending our year about $5,000. So it's very tight at the end of the, this fiscal year. Our budget for next year, the board approved a 4.05% budget. During our process and our work through the town, we were, able to we were able to identify significant savings in diesel fuel, health insurance, and technology. And so another thing I think the, that's very important is we start building our budget in November. And so when we provide a budget to the board, that's, that's very early January. We typically have finalized that before we, we leave for the, the um, holiday in December. So we basically finalized our, our budget in December. We know very little about how much diesel fuel is gonna cost in July or how much health insurance is gonna cost in July in December. We have a pretty good idea, but we don't have that final number. We've got, we received very good news this year. And so when the board presented its budget to the town, we immediately provided them with $635,000 of savings. That's a, a, it was a pretty unique um, move, I will say, um, that we were able to do that. It was a large number and we felt it was a, a important to share that with the town. That was taken off the board's budget, so our budget started at 3.07% approved by the town. Um, since that time, we have made reductions. Um, we've had to make reductions in our kindergarten parents. We've had to make reductions in our teachers. Um, we've had to um, make reductions in student activities in, in certain transportation areas. We've had to do some, some layoffs to do that. As we look at, we still have a $450,000 um, reduction to, to deal with. So if this budget passes uh, next Tuesday, we still have $450,000 to, to reduce. We are looking at a, attrition. So one of uh, um, the, the things of being a, a large organization like we are. We have a number of retirements that come in on June 30th, and so it, it behooves us, it's our best interest to look at those open positions first rather than lay off other teachers or staff members. So we are looking at that, um, but I'm very concerned with what happens beyond that, because but what happens beyond that, we are talking about programs, and we are talking about sports, and we're talking about increase, increasing class sizes, um, gifted and talented, and we are looking at, at, at layoffs because we basically, we are in our fiscal year now, as you know, and we are, um, you know, very restricted in terms of things we can, uh, we can do in terms of reductions. There was two questions that came in, um, and, and, and Jenny asked me to uh, address those, those now, uh, because they came in prior to the event. That was an option that uh, citizens had. And so the first one was on school staffing. We provided those uh, reports, and as I mentioned, they're on the website as well. Um, the other one was a, a four-parter. I, I think there's really only two parts that I can address. The other, I think, was, was more just some statements. But one of the questions was, um, why are we um, providing students with tutoring and support for SAT and um, advanced placement classes? Um, you know, why are we incurring those expenses? And what I will share with you is, is that our measure has been up until this point um, a state test called the CAP for the high school. It, it changed this year. We took a different test this year. Um, and the SAT and, and advanced placement classes. So there's really those three measures when you look at the measure of a high school. The state of Connecticut through its work, and this was something we anticipated, but we did not, um, we did not know this for sure, but the state legislator has taken away that old test. So the CAP, and, and it was the, called the SBAC this year, not to go into too many acronyms, but um, so that's leaving us with the SAT as the major, major measure for a high school that they're going to look at. We're pleased with that move. We supported that move because I will tell you that Windsor High School students, that the, the vast majority of our students take the SAT. So until now, I never, I never, we never really felt like that was a fair measure for us because we have over 90% of our students take the SAT and to compare us to maybe a district where only 70% of their students take the SAT, it, it made that comparison very difficult. But for next year, the state will be funding SAT, um, the, the SAT test for all of Windsor students. So that's our measure. And so it, it's certainly in our best interest to prepare our students as much as possible for the SAT, for, for, for not only their, their um, benefit, which is 
which is huge. We want them to go to the, co the college of their choice, but also for our, our measure as a district. Advanced placement is also a, a measure that we have, and we've um, always worked hard to uh, prepare our students as much as possible for the uh, advanced placement test. The Windsor students do very well on the advanced placement test. We have consistently raised the number of tests we give, the number of students that are taking advanced placement, and our scores have maintained about a 70% um, rating, which is uh, um, a very, very strong rating. That qualifies those students for the credits in, in college. The other question that was uh, came through with, in that four-parter was, um, do you see any potentially negative consequences to encouraging children to be taken out of their families to attend um, free pre-K, um, you know, and how that affects the broader population? So um, I, I, I do not, you know. So in the past, we used to have a half-day kindergarten program. We went to a full-day kindergarten program. We've seen the benefits of, of that program. We have our kindergartners leaving kindergarten reading <coughs> double the grade level, double the percentage of students that are at grade level leaving kindergarten than they were prior in a half day program. We believe that providing a um, high quality preschool will provide a similar result. The, the research on preschool is, is compelling. There, there's really no better way to spend our, our funds if we're looking at it, at it as a district and as the whole child than, than preschool. Um, so I, I do believe that uh, um, Preschool is, is very important to us. So, with that, I think I've answered those questions. Thank you very much for those opening comments. I think we, we appreciate it, and I think we're ready to get some questions started. So, if you have a question, if you would like to make your way over to this area, and I ask that you pick up that mic, don't be shy, go ahead, talk right into it. There you go. Good evening, thanks for coming. My name is Dr. Phil Felberg. I've been a resident here since 75. So my question, Mr. Susan did a great job explaining where the money comes and where the money goes. Then the superintendent said, oh, we've had all these savings. So my specific question is, what alternatives have been pursued looking at health benefits for town employees, for all the employees? Because I know it doesn't matter, independent, Democrat, or Republican, um, there's another state where they addressed that and made significant savings, you know where it is, that a good friend of mine got 900 bucks back on his taxes because they addressed the high increases in their health benefits. So are there alternatives that you're looking at, either self-insured or other options? Thank you for the question. Um, on both accounts, we have um, been, been addressing the issue of increased health insurance costs. Um, the town approximately four years ago um, went to um, what I'll term self-insured. The Board of Education went, I believe, two years ago. And so we have, we have seen substantial savings in that area. We have also, on the town side, created an employee wellness program. We have approximately, um, I think as of last week, we had about 75 full-time employees participating in that. And that is a program that you'll see all of us crazy folks somewhere around here. I have my this little thing called a Fitbit. And so we're all walking around counting our steps and we have various incentives. And so that um, both short-term but more importantly long-term that we're trying to incentivize. Um, this is hard for me because I'm a chocolate holic. I love my chocolate. I can find chocolate anywhere in town hall at 11 o'clock at night, no matter how hard they try to hide it. Um, but it is trying to teach us how to be um, to better um, nutrition, better wellness programs. So for the long time, long term, when we are retired, that helps to reduce our retiree health insurance costs as well. I'm not sure, Craig, if you have anything else to add to that or not. I, I think one of the things that's been very beneficial to us is that um, our increases in health insurance have been um, around 2.5% over the last uh, three, four years. That's been great if you compare us to other boards of education. It's really been a, a, a savings for us. Um, so I think we've done a lot of work through our collective bargaining agreements, negotiations with unions, and um, our work with our insurance consultant. But moving to self-insurance has been a huge benefit for us, too, because you avoid taxes, as you, as you know. I just are two different things. For about six years now, we have been part of a statewide coalition in terms of purchasing our um, prescription drugs. 
And so we've got significant cost containment in terms of, jo again, joining together in bulk purchasing and cooperative purchasing. We also offer um, to our employees a high deductible health savings account option as well, which, which does reduce the cost long term. Community wellness right there, making sure no one passes out up here. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, who's next? Let's get this party going. Good evening, I'm Waldo Lander. Uh, I've lived in Windsor for almost 14 years, right on Quantic Avenue up here. <clears throat> there was one comment made in the presentation that the workers' comp premiums are going up. Um, if there's been a decrease in personnel, uh, the workers' comp premiums, unless there's a bad experience rating, should be going down. So do we have bad experience ratings in the workers' comps where people are out for extended periods or whatever it may be? Thank you. The two-part answer to that. Um, in terms of our work experience, um, or experience level, we have had a, one or two significant um, injuries that have created that experience, that trend. We are, um, both the Board of Education and the town, we have one workman's combined workman's comp program. We have one risk manager for both organizations, and so we do gain efficiencies from that perspective. Um, but we've had one or two long-term um, injuries that have increased that, but also we're in, um, similar to uh, many other organizations, just the general cost of health insurance in medical, the medical costs are contributing to that, um, driving up that cost. Uh, but we do have a, um, I would say a fairly aggressive risk management program where we do um, a fair amount of training, especially in our high um, risk jobs, our public works in our police departments. We do a significant amount of training, safety training, and awareness. Um, so we are attempting to, uh, uh, to mitigate those costs, but unfortunately some of those are outside of our control. I did want to mention if you might be a little bit shy of um, asking your question, we do have some note cards that you can jot your question down and then um, someone mysterious or me will read them. And we're going to pass those around now. But please feel free to come on and stand up and uh, ask your questions. I don't want to hug Mike, but it's a quick follow up. How much of the employee health benefits, town and school, are being shared with the employees? Is that continuing to increase, or are we, the town taxpayers, continuing to pay no matter where it goes? Because in private industry, we're all having to belly up to the bar and pass some of that on to our employees. So on the, on the school side, the debt ranges from basically 15% to 20% for our um, school unions. And I think as we, as we look at um, negotiations, we're, we're always maybe a percent or, or two above the state average for school districts. And we're similar on the town side, where I believe right now we are at 17%. Um, um, and then in the out years of one of our contracts, it goes to 19. Closer to this mic as well. Thank sure. You. Uh, my name is Bob Schwinier. I live um, in Walden Woods. I've lived in Windsor since 1985. Um, my question, you guys have been on the road, so my question comes from driving around seeing signs that say huge budget increases. Um, I was wondering if you could share with all of us what the definition of huge is and what may have elicited that response. Uh, it seems to me we live in a 2% economy and your budget seems to reflect uh, within that realm. So what I'm asking is, what is your sense that really tapped into the community, the 20% who did vote, um, that may have gotten that kind of um, public display out in front of houses? This is speculation on my part. Um, 
but I do believe that um, $106 million is a lot of money. And I think that folks, um, and they look at perhaps that the school budget is approaching 62, 64% of that overall budget or $65 million. I think um, for many people that may be, ju it just may be a large number. Um, but as the superintendent mentioned, our roughly 62% of our budget that goes to the schools um, is pretty much in line, at least with my, my research, is pretty much in line when we look across, across the state. Um, so anything more than that would be, would be speculation on my part, and I care not to, to do that this evening. Okay. Next person up at the mic. Don't forget, everyone, you get one question before we start going back for a second question. So if you want to ask a question, I would love for you to start making your way to the microphone. Yes, ma'am. My name is Agnes Pio. Um, this is for you, Dr. Cook, and I think it's a spin-off of the prior gentleman's um, question. The question is that we have seen information in numerous places around town that it's costing $22,000 per student to go to Windsor Schools. Could you address where that figure might have come from? Sure, thanks, thanks Agnes. Um, so if, if, you take, if you take our budget, if you take the, the full budget number, and you take out the students that do not attend Windsor Schools, that attend magnet schools, that are outplaced for special education, and you take out um, some of the other other some of the other all the students. So you're taking out about 600 students in that in that um, definition, and you take a very conservative, which was on the low side, which I had explained to the board um, about that. That our our estimate from the professional firm was on the low side next year. So you you take those two things and you simply divide the bigger number, the the you know the budget account by the low number of students, that's where you come up with $22,000. But I know, and um, you know, we've, I've, I've explained this quite a bit to, uh, to people, you can't, you can't take out students and then not take out the cost that associated with that students. So if, you have, if I have a student that is, that is outplaced through a um, special education um, agreement under a state mandate, basically, that, that is outplaced, you can't take out that one student and then take, not take out the cost that we're paying for tuition for that student. So that I think is is what um, was was done there. Um, you know, in, in terms of that. So we we spent a lot of time trying to explain that. I think my my speculation on those on those signs that, that came up because we were you know surprised to to see them is is that um, they're they're geared to to get read. So I don't think that. Um, you know, at the time of our first budget um, request, I don't think slightly above average budget gets gets read on that sign. So I think that's where the huge came from. I think the twenty-two thousand dollars gets read. I don't think the um, the real facts, you know, would would get read. So that's my speculation on that in terms of why that. Because we did even prior to those signs going up, try and explain that information. Um, our board president um, gave lots of information back to people who had come to a board meeting and shared, um, shared that calculation and how they came up with that calculation. So we spent a lot of time trying to do that, but it, it still went on. Thank you very much. I have um, some of your questions that have been submitted. I really want to stress that we have to stick to one question per person. And I can't, I, I can't read some of the opinion parts of these, so I'm going to try my very best to make these neutral language sounding questions because um, that's what the spirit of this forum is for. So does anyone want to do it? Come on up. Hi, my name is Mark McCann. I think I've been here uh, 1999. Uh, kind of a two-part thing in terms of the education budget and maybe address it on the website, but um, what can you tell me about the enrollment for kindergarten and are you going to increase the hiring with the teachers? Are you going to add teachers? And I know they said something. Hold on. We can only do one question at okay. Thank you. So our average enrollment for kindergarten is around 215 students. Our um, plan that is still in place for, for next year is to add an additional kindergarten teacher to both of uh, Paquanic and Oliver Ellsworth, which would bring class sizes based on our projection 
to around 13 to 14 students per classroom per kindergarten. Okay, one of the questions that we've received from the audience is, will we know where reductions will be made before next week's vote? And it's specifically, We have not had an opportunity to finalize that reduction in the reason is is because we are we are putting a lot of time into looking at that four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. When we when we first received that information from the town, um, we started to look at um, other accounts. We're still working through some items that would maintain employees over um, say outside costs. And so our goal with any reduction and any time we build the budget is to have um, the least impact on students as as possible in a negative way. Um, or, you know, or, or anything we're adding to have the most, the most positive impact on students. So um, we're looking at with the board of having a meeting, the, you know, slightly after um, that budget is set, probably on the 10th or 11th of uh, August. Okay, we did cover this one last night, so I am going to um, read this one first. What happens to the extra money that is not used at the end of the year with your budget? Does it go back to the school? It, it all goes back to the town. We, we cannot maintain an account after June 30th, so any um, funds left over after June 30th, after we've paid all those um, bills, go back to the town. There have been years where we've returned half a million dollars, $400,000, um, and then there's been years like, like this one where we anticipate that we we're returning very little money. Are the school budgets audited? Yes, along with the town, we are audited every year. Is the Board of Education still pursuing pre-K and conversion, conversion of Roger Wolcott? So everything uh, has been put on hold. We um, received a state grant that would have brought in a, a total, if we utilized it completely, of $3.3 million over a 10-year period for preschool. We are starting two new, pro, two new classrooms. And let me say, we had four preschool classrooms this year. We had, all, we had a required program by the state. We're required to provide preschool to a student who needs special ed services. So we had four classrooms. They were all at Oliver Ellsworth. We are adding two additional classrooms of preschool paid by the state grant that we received for, for next year. In terms of where this would go from, from here, that's a discussion I think the board will begin again with the, with the town council. I think there's. Um, lots of options to be looked at, and you know, at this point, I, I really don't know what the future holds for that. But I'm I'm pleased that we're able to offer again through a state grant um, at preschool to uh, 30 additional students that meet the qualifications of the grant. Um, we did, I, I'm going to read this question, and I'm going to also give you another piece of information. If there are any questions that are asked today that are um, speakers don't have the answer to right off the top of their heads. We are going to capture those questions and have the response put in the paper this Friday. That way everyone can read it and you know the answers to the questions that we may not uh, be able to answer tonight or, or Thursday. So this one is, given all the contracted costs or fixed costs, what is that dollar amount for the school year 15-16? So as, as we began the budget process, if you looked at our six collective bargaining agreements with our, with our employees and our other fixed costs, as I mentioned, uh, transportation and special education tuition, we were looking at $1.9 million just in those, those areas of fixed costs. So we are, we are below what our fixed costs were. So that goes back to the um, process that I explained a little bit about that we were making reductions prior to even bringing a, a, a budget forward. So um, we're below our fixed cost right now. All right, I want to offer anyone to take the short trip over to the microphone and ask a question in person if you'd like. Okay, I have one more. No worries, we'll, we'll still come to your questions that are being written. Um, this one, I'm going to say it as a question. Um, if all magnet school students are serviced in district, would that help the budget? So, so the short answer would be, would be yes, in my opinion. This is very much in my opinion. Because 
As we look at magnet schools, students returning to Windsor, they would be spread out between grades K to 12, with the majority of them being at our middle school and high school. Um, I think that we've heard from lots of longtime residents, they, re they remember a time when uh, Windsor High School had 1,400, 1,500 students in, in, in there. We have 1,200 there now. They remember a time when, when um, Sage Park had 900, um, 1,000, 1,100 students in there, and, and we have about 700 students at Sage Park now. So there is, there is space. I mean, we would certainly go through a lot of um, hiring and changing and, and, and things like that to meet the needs of those, those students. Um, I will say, though, at the elementary level, um, K to 5, with the, with the reorganization that the um, board went through, we are um, at pretty much full capacity, Al Oliver Ellsworth in, in JFK. We did have some space at Pequannock and um, Clover, but mostly Pequannock. We've utilized that space at Pequannock by moving a program from Oliver Ellsworth to Pequannock for next year and um, adding the, one of the preschool classrooms there as well as a kindergarten classroom. So our elementary schools are, are heavily utilized um, with, with certain mandates and, and programs that we have um, coming, coming around that, uh, um, you know, there, there's, we, we have more space needs than we, we did years ago, but uh, there is, um, you know, there is some room for, for those magnet schools to uh, students coming back. Thank you. Okay. Our kindergarten paras being eliminated. So in the, um, in the first budget that went out to the, the public, kindergarten paras were part of that, that budget. We had 12 kindergarten paras um, in there. And after the se second budget reduction, um, actually, excuse me, the second budget defeat, the board met and reviewed um, a $750,000 decrease that they had to make in the, in the budget, and the 12 kindergarten paras were part of that reduction that was made at that time. For folks that asked questions in the room at the podium, if you wanted to come back and ask a second question. Oh, Jane, come, Jane, come on. You know how this goes. She tried to trick me yesterday by asking two questions right in a row. We need about 10 nights for me. I know. My questions for our town manager, Mr. Sousa. You talked about that there's been a reduction of six staff members over the past few years. What has that impacted? And if you had a wish list. Let's start with your first question. It's very direct. Okay. I was asking too. I know. She won't do it. She's going to make me need a Christmas list. She's <laughs> The six positions that I referenced are over a 10 year period from fiscal year 2006. To, to now, so a ten, basically a 10 year period. And those have been pretty much across the organization. Public Works Department is down um, a couple positions. As I mentioned, we no longer have um, a full time director as part of our um, human services or social services department. That is now a part time position. Um, we have one less um, full time position in our, um, a, one less clerk in our um, assessing department. Um, now we have a part-time clerk instead of a full-time clerk. Um, and so they're pretty much scattered throughout the, the organization. Um, the police department, I believe, with the addition that the town council authorized a year ago, I believe now we're pretty much level where we were um, 10 years ago. And the town council had added those positions in anticipation of a number of retirements that the police department will be or has experienced and will be experiencing. Um, as um, you may not know, it takes approximately 10 months for a police recruit to go through training, um, both in the academy and then in the field, before they're able to ride solo, if you will. And um, obviously, with the authority and responsibility that we provide, that, that are given to those um, officers, um, 10 months of training. Um, is appropriate to make sure that they're ready to, um, to provide good quality service for our residents as well as to protect themselves and their colleagues. Um, so it's been pretty much spread across the organization. I will note that this budget that's before the voters um, on Tuesday does include one new full-time position, and that is an emergency dis dispatcher um, within our um, uh, police department. The police department, those emergency dispatchers 
do serve all three of our public service agencies as well as our general government. And so they dispatch for police, fire, and EMS, as well as monitor the radio and communicate with our um, public works department and our health department um, as part of the responsibilities as well. And my, as far as my wish list goes, as a professional manager, I don't have a wish list. I just identify what the needs are and what um, I believe that the community needs in order to continue to grow forward. If you weren't familiar with what the second part of Jane's question was going to be, it was going to be, if you had a wish list, what would it be? So that was the answer. <laughs> a needs list, a needs list. Okay, we're going to do last call for first questions, and then we're going to open it up to anyone who's asked the question before, and just come on up and... Sandy Gustafson, and I've lived in Windsor for over 50 years. Um, I have, I'm one of the strange people that watch the Board of Education and the Town Council meeting. So I'm a little informed in what is going on, but a lot of people aren't. I think this has been fantastic to hold this in three different sections of town and given the people the opportunity to ask their questions and their concerns. I would suggest, looking ahead, that next year, maybe before we go to vote, we have something like this. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there, just for a second, unless you have a question. No, that, that is all I wanted want to say. All right, well, I would like to call, ask the town manager and um, Dr. Cook for, for everyone's edification, have there been sessions that the citizens could attend in order to become more knowledgeable on the budget before this week? There's a variety of ways in which we've attempted to get the um, inf budget information out. Um, starting in um, probably about six years ago, we started at I started to create um, a series of budget workshops. And so starting in January, there's an initial, what I call kind of a budget 101, very similar to what I provided um, as my introduction, just goes a little bit deeper. Um, there's opportunity in January. And then in um, February, usually late February, we, I provide another opportunity um, for folks to come and get an update on where we are. At that point, we usually receive the governor's proposed budget in early February, and as I mentioned earlier, with approximately 15% of our revenues coming from the state, that's usually a big number. It's a big, a big um, factor as we put together our budget. And then in late March, um, prior to presenting the budget to the full council, there, um, I provide an overview of what the proposed budget will be so that folks um, leading up to the public hearing that first Monday in April, um, the community has an opportunity to have a little bit more information prior to um, that opportunity. And then throughout the month of um, April, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, um, televised, the town council reviews all of the budgets, and so there's opportunities for folks to at least gain more information along that lines. I'd also put a plug in for, um, and I see recognize a few faces here who have gone through our Citizens Academy. Each fall we offer a, I believe it's a seven week um, uh, program, which we have um, all the departments, including the um, Board of Education, the uh, superintendent. Um, it meets usually on a Wednesday or Thursday evening for a couple hours, and it provides an overview and insight into the workings of each of our town departments. Um, we don't necessarily go into the budget at that point, but you, you really get to see what level of service and type of services your tax dollars are, are going um, going towards. And so um, keep an eye on that. You should be getting, uh, towards the end of the summer, you'll be getting the, um, uh, I call it our, our magazine. There's a lot to do in Windsor. And within that, it will have information about the Citizen Academy as well. Um, so I'm not sure, yeah. Craig, if there's anything else you want to add to that. I know that the, your finance committee meets as well. So, so the board does some uh, similar activities in terms of trying to get public input into the budget as we start our process. There's a, a public forum that the board holds prior to its um, board meeting, also prior to our budget workshops, which we had four this year, 
um, and on different nights of the week to try and meet people where they're able to, uh, to join us. Um, we typically have done a Saturday, but our Saturday got snowed out. Um, but we, uh, we do have those open, open forums. Thank you for watching. And I, I do agree because, it, you know, I think for, for myself, it, in terms of the school questions that come forward, as, as you see, most of them take minutes to respond to. And so um, forums like this, I think, are really um, beneficial for us because it, it does take a while to respond to some of the questions out there. And this is very beneficial. Hi, my name is Lori Lavasser. I've lived here since 1993. Um, I don't know a lot about um, you know, the town charter. Um, so when, well, when the budget is put together, we've got a board of ed component, and then we have a town component. So if we get hung up on one portion, like a board of ed piece, that um, doesn't allow us to approve the budget. So is there any consideration that can be given to separate the two? And if residents get hung up on, on one aspect, that there can be further discussion? Or how, how, does, how does that work? Thank you very much. Thank you. The town's charter um, does call for the entire budget to be voted on um, as a whole. In order to, the state law does allow for the um, town general government budget to be voted on as separate from the Board of Education budget. There is a handful of communities in the state that um, do vote separately on the school budget and the general government budget. Um, in Windsor, that would require a charter review commission to be created and then that uh, any changes to the town charter would then have to be um, brought to the voters and approved. So that entire process is um, outlined in state law and so the town council would not be able to make that change unilaterally. They would first have to create a charter commission and then be able, then be able to put that to the vote of the citizenry. All right. Thank you. I'm Bonnie Karkowski. Um, I have a question for Dr. Cook. Um, as the um, product of a public school system in which uh, there were 30 to 40 students per class, I wonder um, what the average class size is in each of our schools and if that could be increased to save us money. That's all. Thank you. I know that was too sneaky. Hey, it's late and it's hot, so go ahead. So we, we have been looking at that. Our, our average class sizes at the elementary level are about 17 students per classroom. Um, you know, I think that we feel that that is a, a, a very strong instructional model in that it allows teachers to differentiate for students in the classroom. We have um, classes that go up to 22, 23. Um, we have some under that, um, you know, throughout. So it's, it's really spread out throughout the district. The reorganization did allow us to um, make that more equalized. Before the reorganization, there was much more of a, a, a spread, but for next year, we're looking at, like I said, 17 to 18 students per, per classroom. Um, I, would, I would say, you know, in, in most districts, class sizes have, have dropped over the years. During recent budget difficulties, they have increased in, in other towns, but there's, uh, um, you know, I think we're slightly below average in terms of uh, Connecticut, and I think that that's been able to allow our teachers and staff to provide, you know, the best education to our students. Okay. I think we're going to do a last call for the whole room for any questions, written or otherwise. Don't run. Yes, uh, Gary Johnson. I've lived in town since 1978. This is uh, for Peter a question. Windsor is one of the few towns that, that collects taxes once per year. Those of us who are lucky enough to not have a mortgage or, or, or older, um, paying that sometimes is, is a big chunk of money, and 95% and of the rest of the state pays it in two payments. I own property out of state that does two payments, and I, it's always been, well, we'll lose some interest. Well, interest rates that you accrue on your money is probably not that high now, 
And, and two, if they did it at a 60-40 split or something like that, maybe an opportunity. Maybe it's time to think about that again because it may be more palatable to those. And, and you know, we're not going to get more people to come out. It seems like the electorate is about 20 percent, so we're not going to suddenly find 80 percent of the people that don't vote on the budget. Thank you. Your time is the last. Um, do you want to take the first part of that question? One, and certainly that is a policy question for the town council um, to review. Um, they did review that, I'm going to say, probably six years ago or thereabouts, um, and they chose to remain um, with the one collection um, system. Um, part of that is our, um, is a cost factor. And the, our FTEs or full-time equivalents within our tax collection office is lower than other communities that have the same or similar um, number of taxable accounts um, because of that one collection. Um, we, we have a 90, over 98% collection rate and part of that is due to our ability to um, spend the better part of our year um, chasing that small percentage of folks who are in arrears. And um, we had done it, this is off the top of my head, but we had done a um, a review back about six years ago, and it was our estimation that we would have to add staff. Right now, we have one, we have two full-time people in our tax collection office, and then a seasonal uh, and, par and a part-time person for the summer. And our estimation is that we would have to add staff um, for that second billing collection. Um, and so there would be some cost associated with that. And I think that went into um, consideration that the town council took um, roughly a half a, uh, or six years ago. Right, the time has come. This gentleman is going to ask the last question of the evening. My name is Dennis Reardon. I can't tell you how long I've lived in Windsor. You'll have to ask my wife that. <laughs> uh, in fact, I can't even tell you how long we've been married. But, uh, uh, this is more a suggestion than a question. And we're going to hold right there, just because, to be fair to everyone. Um, we're not going to take comment. Or, All right, I'll phrase it as a question. That would be great. Thank you. Is there anything that you can do to put out everything that was brought up here tonight prior to the first budget vote? If you talk to the people in this room, most of them would say the first thing when I went in to vote on the first budget, I saw signs, huge increase, this, that, and also they just knew that school budget was very large. They had no facts. That plus the answers that were given here tonight, if somebody could put out ahead of time a piece of paper, a flyer, anything, be it the League of Women Voters or whoever does it, okay. with some graphs. I'm going to stop you just to make sure everyone has the same amount of time. Um, who wants to handle the, the, um, the question? Can we do something like this ahead of time? The short answer is we can always try to improve information and communication. Um, in this crazy world that we live in today, we get all get bombarded with information. Um, some of the items that we handed out um, that some of you may have seen, somebody can hold up the, the beautiful yellow piece, which we refer to as budget and brief. Um, we do put those out in, um, in April. Um, and so certainly we can try to get different pieces out there. Um, it's certainly not a mailing to every, um, to every home, um, but the short answer is we certainly can continue to try to, to, to improve the ways that we can get fact, factual information out. All right, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. This was very interactive, very helpful. And to see last night's forum, Win TV, there's also a link for YouTube. Tonight's will be tomorrow, and Thursday's will be down the line after we've all had a chance to cool off. So thank you very much and have a good evening.